Welcome to Research Talk. My name is Rakesh and I'm a research scholar at the University of Wyoming. In this video, which is the second part of our uh, coverage on validity and reliability in qualitative research, I will be talking about some more ways to improve trustworthiness of qualitative study. So you remember in our last video, we talked about triangulation method and how we can use various kinds of triangulation to improve the trustworthiness of qualitative study. In this video, we will talk some more methods about uh, how we can improve trustworthiness. So another way of improving uh, the trustworthiness of a qualitative study is through member checks or we also call it respondent validation. In, in members checks or respondent validation, what we do, we analyze the data and we come up with the tentative themes emerging out, the, out of the data. And then we contact again to the participants and share these initial tentative findings and seek their feedback, uh, what they think about it. And the reason why we do that, because as researchers, there are chances that we misinterpret the data. Whatever the participant have shared with us, we may have uh, you know, misinterpreted what they wanted to say. So to minimize this misinterpretation of the data, we do members check. So after the initial tentative findings, we, we sit again with the participants and share these initial findings to make sure that uh, uh, whatever we, uh, direction we are taking is, is, is what the participants intends to, to share with us. Third way to improve the trustworthiness of a quali qualitative study is by engaging in the data collection process. So what it means that collection of data to a saturation point. So when we start collecting data, so let's say we interviewed the first participant, second participant, third participant, and as we collect data, simultaneously we also analyze the data. So we transcribe the interview data and then we start analyzing as well. So in the beginning, we, we come up with these you know, uh, findings, uh, you know, the themes that are emerging out of, the, out of the data. But what happens after a certain point, we start getting the same uh, data again and again. So let's say after interviewing and analyzing 10 participants, when I interviewed 11th participant, 12th participants, there is nothing new things coming out of that data. What the, these participants like 11, 12, 13, 14th participants are sharing, they are sharing the same stuff that we have already covered, we have already analyzed. So we call it a saturation point. Saturation point is some a point where uh, a researcher doesn't get anything new. And what we do, we stop collecting further data after we reach this saturation point. So as a researcher, if we want to make sure that we have a high level of trustworthiness in our study, we have to make sure that we reach this saturation point. Another thing that we do as a researcher to make sure that we have a, a strong uh, you know, engagement in the data collection process is by making sure to include uh, negative cases. Uh, what are negative cases? Negative cases are, let's say you are interviewing participants and they are kind of talking the similar things and then you find one participants who, who, whose experience or whatever that, that participant is sharing is completely different from all the other participants. Now, as a researcher, you may think that, okay, let me you know, uh, ignore this participant just as an outlier and not include it. But doing that will really uh, weaken the uh, trustworthiness of your study. So what you can do, Yes, there are, you know, let's say 10 participants who talks about similar things and you come up with the themes out of those experiences. But the one participant whose experiences are completely different, you make sure you include when you when you talk about uh, 
those themes and when you write your manuscript you don't ignore that thing and we so we we call it negative cases so uh, this is what as a researcher we have to ensure to make sure that uh, our research study has a high level of trustworthiness to ensure that you have an adequate engagement in the data collection by making sure you reach the saturation point and if there are any negative cases you also make sure that you include in that research another common way of improving uh, trustworthiness of a qualitative study is through researcher position or reflexivity. So researchers reflexivity is a critical self reflection of researcher uh, uh, which talks about researchers assumptions, world views, biases, theoretical orientation and how the researcher is related to the study. So in the manuscript, when you prepare the manuscript, you talk briefly about, about your own position in relation to the study, and we call it reflexivity, researcher's reflexivity. So uh, to make it more uh, clear, let me share my own experience. So last year, I did a, a study where I explored counselors' lived experiences of empathy and compassion. So I interviewed counselors and, and tried to explore what, is, what are their experiences of empathy and compassion uh, in therapeutic context. So after analyzing the data and when I was preparing the manuscript, I talked about researchers' position or reflexivity. So I can just show it to you here and you can just have a look at it uh, where I have talked about my assumptions, my biases, my orientation, and how I am positioned in relation to this study. So uh, I have written, as all the data in qualitative research pass and are filtered through the researcher's lens, it is important to share how I am positioned this study. So I'm very open about like, okay, I did this study, but I want to be very open about what are my personal biases and how I am related to this study. So I further talk, my research interest in empathy and compassion stems from my own experiences of utilizing an empathic stance towards my clients in the therapy. So I have now started talking about how I am positioned in relation to the study. However, over identification with clients through empathy sometimes affected my effectiveness as a counselor. This phenomenon intrigued me. Also, my initiation, initiation into yoga practice four years ago exposed me to the construct of compassion, which helped me a lot in enhancing my therapeutic presence with clients. My negative experiences of empathic distress and positive experiences with compassion motivated me to explore these two constructs in terms of their therapeutic value. Being a yoga practitioner and an advocate for mindfulness practice for enhancing well-being, I may have some biases towards compassion as compared to empathy. So you saw, uh, I'm very open about um, and very mindful about my own personal biases as a researcher, and I am talking about how I am positioned as a researcher in this study. So if you are conducting any qualitative study, you will be talking about your own position, why uh, you got interested in this topic briefly, and how uh, your, uh, you know, what are your personal biases and how you are positioned this study. So this is what we do uh, uh, to make sure to enhance the uh, trustworthiness of a qualitative study. Uh, if you read uh, qualitative research articles, you might see that researchers talks briefly, maybe just uh, one paragraph where they talk about their personal biases and how they are positioned, how they are, uh, got interested in this study and how they are positioned in the study. Another uh, important way of enhancing the trustworthiness of qualitative study is through audit trail. What is audit trail? So audit trail refers to a detailed account of methods, procedures, decision points uh, uh, while you are conducting the study. And how you do that? 
so to to keep a detailed account of of a major decision point in the study uh, you know why you choose a particular method of data collection so so keep a keep a detailed account of of this thing uh, most of the researchers keep a journal and keeping a journal is is i think one of the most effective way of minimizing your own personal biases and improving the trustworthiness of a qualitative study so what you write in a journal uh, and, and and you you start keeping this journal from the very beginning of the process of a qualitative study so let's say if i am doing this research on international student experiences in counselor education programs uh, the moment i start con uh, start contacting my participant uh, I start, uh, you know, keeping this journal and uh, start writing my own reflections about, you know, why I choose this way of data collection method. Uh, and then when I go and interview these participants, then I can, you know, write my own reflections. How was my experience talking to this particular participant? And uh, sometimes participants, you know, while while during the interview, you might notice something. So you might see that the participant you know their eyes are moist uh, their their voice tone changes so these things uh, may not be captured uh, when you are recording the interview so you can just make a note out of it and later on you just write little more detail about it after the interview and also like let's say if you are analyzing the data you are reading the manuscript uh, oh, sorry, not manuscript, the, the transcript. And then uh, while reading the transcript, something come up, come to your mind in terms of uh, a theme, in terms of a category, in terms of, you know, an idea related to, uh, to the topic, and you just note it down. And why you do that, when you analyze the data, you, you use your journal as a way, as a tool, to to understand and to interpret the data so so this is a way of of enhancing the the trustworthiness of a study so uh, as a researcher I, I i suggest all the qualitative researcher the moment you start a topic uh, you know exploring a qualitative study you you must uh, you should i highly recommend it to keep a journal where you note down your reflections uh, and, and use those reflections when you are analyzing the data and you are writing your manuscript. All right, so that was the end of the part two. And I talked about these four methods of, of how we can enhance the trustworthiness of a qualitative study. In the third part, I'll talk about uh, a few more methods uh, of enhancing the trustworthiness of a qualitative study. Thank you for listening and have a great time. Bye-bye.